Hello guys, Mathemos right here and welcome to this video on how I tried to bring an Acorn A7000 Plus to my setup. First, a bit of context on this computer. In 1994, Acorn Computers announced their replacement to their Archimedes lineup, specifically the higher end A5000 with the Risk PC, which while significantly faster, it was out of touch for most home users with a price tag of £1,199 in 1994, including a display or an eye-watering £2,255 when adjusted for inflation. So this left a gap in the market that was still being filled by the older Archimedes lineup. In 1995, Acorn finally released the A7000, a system on a chip loosely based on the RISC PC's architecture. The SOC was the ARM7500 clocked at 48MHz and 4MB of FPM RAM which was upgradable to 132MB. There was no video memory and nowhere near as expandable to its higher end sibling. I sold for a more attainable £889 for the baseline specification which is £1629 when adjusted for inflation. It received mostly good reviews in magazines such as Acorn User and was equated its performance to a Risk PC 600, which at this time has been out for several months. Three years later, Acorn brought out an upgraded model dubbed as the A7000 Plus. This boosted the clock speed to 56 MHz over 48. It sold a floating point engine, something that even the high end Risk PCs ever received, and upgraded the RAM subsystem to support the EDL standard and doubled the baseline capacity to 8 MB. But this did bump up the price to 1099 or 1901 pounds in 2023. Acorn user loved it, saying the computer's equivalent performance is that of a Risk PC 700 with one megabyte of video memory, and it's the ideal machine with none of the strong incompatibility problems. This machine proved both to be successful, and the last new computer Acorn would release before closing down their workstation division a year later. Castle Technologies continued to manufacture the A7000 Plus until 2003. This particular example used to belong to my grandparents. So let's get on to the upgrade. Now if you look at the front of the case, you might actually notice it doesn't have a power button anywhere. And that's because if we look at the back, you'll find uh, along with the reset, audio, SVGA, keyboard and mouse, a little slot where Ethernet would be, parallel and serial ports respectively, up here is the power supply's main switch, which most power supplies have anyway. But this actually acts a bit different because this is actually the main power switch of the system. There's no power buttons like the higher end Risk PC and indeed most previous Archimedes computers. Since this machine belonged to my grandparents originally, this, it does have certain sentimental value to it. So I'm not going to do anything cosmetically to it. I am not going to replace the ROMs or anything like that. Instead, I am just going to do easy reversible upgrades. So after the short term solution, I can put it back to how it was when I found it. Could have said a bit of myself past me. The first job was removing the screws and opening up the case. One screw came out easily while the other had an attitude problem and I could tell this was the start of the trial and tribulations for this project. The case kind of disintegrated when I first opened it which is not something I expected. When you remove the shell you can truly see how compact the entire system is and why you can have an optical drive or a Pajio expansion but not both. Once inside I need to remove two additional screws at the front to remove the drive case and gain access to the hard drive and RAM slot. Here you get to see the motherboard in plain view. A couple of interesting points is the SOC that holds the CPU, GPU and memory controller. RAM is soldered directly to the motherboard with an additional slot that can take up to 128MB. What a time to be alive to have an SOC with an upgradable RAM. Take note Apple. Other interesting points is that you can see the two ROM chips holding the core OS, meaning you could technically boot without a hard drive and you could use it fine. Swapping out these ROMs means you could do things like upgrade the maximum size of drives these machines could take, as that subsystem doesn't seem to have a hard limit compared to other ID controllers of the era. The CMOS battery looked like it was on the way out, but I cut some thick cardboard and slid it underneath the battery to prevent it from corroding the motherboard when it finally bites the dust. Anyways, let's talk about upgrades. The first is this 32MB EDO module to upgrade the RAM to 40MB. Originally I put in a 4MB module, but it wasn't enough for what I wanted. Next up is this SC to IDE controller and a corresponding 4GB SanDisk card. I'll be honest, I didn't think the adapter would work purely due to how picky these IDE controllers are in these acorns. This upgrade in particular was driven by my desire to keep the A7000 Plus's originality by keeping its data intact. The idea being I can easily disconnect the SD card adapter and reconnect it as original hard drive and it would be back as it was. Thank you. 
With the upgrades in place, it was time to connect the A7000 Plus to a display and test it work. The only VGA monitor I had brilliantly available is my old TV set which I had not sold at the time of this video. I love that short burst the floppy drive does as it's self test compared to the long one PCs of the era did. Unfortunately I quickly discovered that, that the Acorn output so as it boots up for some reason is invalid to a TV. So I broke out a VGA to HDMI adapter I was going to present later in the video and hooked it up to the computer. And with a quick reset I could see that it was outputting. Typing in the desktop command in the supervisor fired up the OS in one. And it's pretty usable as is bar a few sacrifices. Oh, a sound man. The satisfaction I get from hearing that sound after so long was just pure nostalgia back to my childhood. I miss that sound so much. Once in H form, I could see that the A7000 Plus saw the adapter just fine, much to my own surprise. So with that, I left the specific parameters to the drive untouched. But when it asked me to initialize, I pressed I and made sure that the drive was set to bootable. And in a matter of two seconds, it was ready to use. I clicked on the drive icon on the icon bar and it loaded straight away and when starting it immediately made the default name show up. So I changed the name to Solid Disk 4 as it is technically a fast based drive and moved on to Dad's Omic 6 to copy a working boot file and data I want to have on the drive. Moving back to the A7000 Plus and nothing. After troubleshooting for a couple of days, I had found out that the problem was human error and I misread one of the prompts in H-Form. When I pressed I, I was supposed to press F for format. Doing this formatted the drive to the correct filing system and initialized the drive. From there, I copied the boot file along with some other goodies and the A7000 Plus saw it immediately. Hey! Now we're cooking with gas! Away! So now we have a perfectly functional WiscoS 3.71 computer. Setting up the SD card was supposed to be the easy part compared to the final modification I wanted to do. As I alluded to earlier, there is no set OS limit on these machines providing you replace the ROM chips, meaning you could easily get the latest and greatest for this computer. Soft loading, however, is a slightly different story. Now soft loading is basically meaning installing a new operating system through software, including loading the required ROM into the RAM first. And there is two worlds you can go with this. On the WiscoS Limited side, you can only officially go to WiscoS 4.02 from 3.60 or 3.7x, with any higher version requiring 4 and 1. On WiscoS Open Limited, however, the sky's the limit, and you can easily grab the latest build of WiscoS 5 to soft load on the A7000 or Whisk PC computer. Unofficially, however, there is no set limit, and a user named Sarbard over on the Stardart forums created a way to softload any version onto these machines, within reason of course. For me, that is 4.39, as that was on my Risk PC as a kid, and it offers the best new features to backwards compatibility ratio. With the readme being more than vague, trying to figure out what to do, especially for someone who never softloaded an OS onto an Acorn before, was more than a trial and error game. Technically, this neat utility is supposed to work with two drives, but it can be modified to work with only one. Getting this to work on boot up proved to be really difficult, as it is clear this is very much a patchwork solution. The problem was once again human error, with the required string to get the softload to work being commented out by default. On commenting the string and resigning the Acorn finally got 4.39 to fire up automatically as if it was running in one. It's not as fast due to the extra step needed on boot up, but it works and I didn't need to swap out the ROMs, making it easily revertible. So that's a win. You'd think it would be smooth sailing from here. Just needed some housekeeping and some personalization things and I'm up to the races laughing. However, there was one problem no amount of troubleshooting or brute forcing would fix and that is video output. The VGA to HDMI adapter I bought turns out to have a hard floor of 480p, and if the video outputs anything lower than that, then you're just flat out of luck. You might be seeing the problem I am implying already, but some games in my library, like Pac-Mania for instance, outputs at almost half that minimum resolution for this cable. Most games I own is at a funny 256p, so that sucks. After finding the cable wasn't fit for purpose, I switched to this VGA to SCART adapter I found online, then convert that to HDMI. But no matter what I did, I got a funny image that is considerably darker than it should be. This makes me think the video chip inside the Acorn when I put something funny that the box simply doesn't like. But it did output all the resolutions I threw at it, and Pac-Mania loaded up as it should. 
So it honestly sucks that I couldn't fix the problem as it would have been a great cheap solution otherwise. Of course, this is glossing over the distinct lack of USB on these machines, so hooking it up to a modern KVM switch would have been problematic to say the least. I do have a similar spec clone, the Micro Digital Micro, which does have USB 1.1 on its Simtech motherboard, but the Micro never received drivers for USB, so they're a dud and purely for show. But the show must go on. I got my faithful LG W1943 SS out of my cupboard and hooked it up downstairs. So let's see how this old girl performs. So here we are with the A7000 Plus all up and running. So let's try out some games. First off is Burnout. Not to be confused with Burnout as they are completely unrelated. Believe me, I thought they were the same when I was a kid. Performance was really good, and in fact, then it was more playable than it was through RPCMU despite the game being strong arm aware. The speed on this was just right. Doesn't mean I'm any better at the game though. Park Killer 2 was the next game I tested, and again, ran flawlessly. This is a game I played quite a lot when I was a kid. Never got past the first level if I recall, but it was nice seeing the background artwork and enemies again. I did try to get another favourite childhood game to run, simply titled Hamsters, but when I start the game it gives me an out of range error on the monitor. It's strange as I know it works on 4.39 as it was on my RISC PC way back when. The menus work as intended though. 3D games now and this is where it got a little shaky for the old acorn. The first game I played was the original 1993 Doom at a resolution of 640x480. It was usable, but not ideal. I wouldn't want to play it this way even if I had to. I tried messing in the in-game settings, but as far as I can tell they don't do anything. So I ended up messing with the resolution outside the game and I could get it running at 320x256. And while this is significantly better in terms of frame rate, the way it was scaling was not. But if I tried to force it to do 320x240, it would just reset to 480p, so that custom resolution option is useless. Moving on though, I tried Starfighter 3000. In window mode, it's frankly unplayable. In full screen though, it's a completely different story. We're talking like 30 to 60 frames per second here. It was honestly just so fun to fly around in the first level. And the fact you could just fly out of the atmosphere and look down to see the entire world below you is still a concept I think is mind boggling, especially for when Starfighter came out. So yeah, that's the first W for 3D games. Then I took a downturn again when I tried Destiny. Honestly, I didn't play much of this game as I got stuck virtually immediately. It took a while to load, but the brief 20 seconds I played this before getting stuck performed really well. I would guess 20 to 30 frames per second. Not terribly high, but playable. Other games I tried to play just wouldn't run. Part of the problem here and the reason frames are so low is because it's all software rendered. While it technically utilises the proprietary video chipset, it's not 3D accelerated. There is now an OpenGL port for RiscOS, but I doubt if many, or any, games I tested would even detect OpenGL installed considering when these games were made. And of course, because it's an Acorn machine, it has built-in multimedia capabilities. Here it is playing a general MIDI file using the Digital Symphony sound font, a once popular tracker for WhiskerOS. So overall, this would have been a perfectly suitable computer for the majority of my games if I could only find a suitable adapter to connect it to my setup. The performance isn't anything groundbreaking, even for computers of the era, but that wasn't really the point of this project. The point of this was for me to have the ability to play, and maybe even stream, my childhood games and software without any quirks that emulation has brought. And sadly, I have failed on that goal despite the Acorn being fully functional. But anyway, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Peace.